the subject of steps to a lasting relationship. And um, I think it's very, it's vital that we spend this time, uh, some time each year on talking about relationships. Um, this is very important to God. That's why he created us. He wanted and desired relationship. And he desired you and I to have relationships with each other. And he gave us this awesome marriage covenant so that he can show the relationship that God desires to have with humanity. He says that the relationship between a husband and a wife is a great mystery, but he said he's talking about Christ and the church. And so, it's so I think it's just absolutely important that we spend time teaching and talking about relationships, sharing some of the same truths that we have learned, and just building on the revelation concerning relationship so that we can have the kind of relationships that God desires, not just husband and wife, but parents and children and other relatives, coworkers, friends, and people that you come in contact with, people that God is divinely connect you with, to cause you to have the relationships that God, if you're single, the relationships that God desire you to have um, in marriage, in when you're dating, when you're having good relationships, and just flat out having good relationships with one another in the house of God. Hallelujah. And so that is our endeavor, but we're, we're going somewhere with this. <laughs> and, and I believe that once we grab a hold of this area of relationships with one another here on the earth, that we'll be better be, best be able to relate to the things that God wants to show us and reveal to us concerning spiritual things. Um, we've talked about God being number one priority. And having and developing that relationship with God, how many know that's an ongoing process? That we never arrive to the place where we got it like that with God, we don't need nothing else. <laughs> God is always unfolding. You talk about singing a song, show us your heart. How many know the heart of God is exhaustible? You cannot exhaust all that God has for us and that he is planted in his heart that he wants us to know. And God is revealing himself more and more to us to, through revelation of the word of God. When we start talking about re relationships, you see the heart of God concerning it. You see what God wants us to have so that he is, his glory will be seen in our lives. And so that you and I, when you're free here in these relationships, that you'll be free to worship God, free to serve him, and you'll not be inhibited by bad things that are happening in your household, in your relationships with your boss, with your spouse. When you're just free, you're free to worship God in that, in that way. You're free to express who God is in the earth, and other people get to know and see who your God is. I believe the last time that Pastor Tony and I were here, we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, powerful scriptures concerning this love walk, and we've asked the Lord to help us. Hallelujah. Y'all getting the help of the Holy Ghost? It is quite all right for you to say something back to me every now and then, all right? <laughs> Just so I know you're not asleep. Praise God. <laughs> the light's in my eyes, so I can't really see your face. So if you're not, I won't know. I just think you're getting happy in Jesus. So, and, and I'm going to just assume I'm, I like that part better, that you're just getting happy in the Lord. And so every now and then say amen so I know you're still here. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate appreciate. And so here, here, here's this um, area of talking about this love of God in every one of us can need to come up in this area, even when the, you decide, and we talked about decreeing things, and you decide, I'm going to walk in the love of God. How many know that that love walk would always be challenged? Yes. Some of you have been challenged this week, challenged today in this love walk, but when you have it in the forefront of your thinking, it will cause you to overcome the challenges, and God will allow things to come your way, challenges to come your way, because your desire is to walk in the love of God. And if you won't know you do that, you've done that until you have challenges, until things come up. You don't know that you're loving or not loving unconditional until conditions come up. And when you're not, not moved by those things, then you know that you have arrived to a certain place so that you're uh, endeavoring to get to, but yet still there's more to come. How many want more? I don't know about you, but I want to experience more and more of the love of God. And he desires for us to experience more and more of the love of God. And the more you're around other people, the more you will experience God's love. Or you'll know what you have a hold of in that quiet time before God. You know what you really got a hold of when it's expressed through somebody else. When you are full of the love of God, it has to be expressed. You cannot keep it to yourself. Somebody's going to benefit from your time with the Lord God. He, when he is your priority, 
Other people will know, they will experience what's on your life, gets on their lives because of what's on you. I think that people were healed by Peter's shadow because of what overshadowed Peter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And because God was the one overshadowing Peter and his love for God, that, that love that came from him, that when people just walked and got in close proximity of his shadow, was healed. I believe that when people get in close proximity of you, who you are, that they'll experience the love of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Because we endeavor to get a hold of this and develop the kind of relationships. And so, number one, we said we had some steps to... Um, having lasting relationship, and, and I think this is part four, and we still was on step number one. We're going to move away from there just a little bit, but God is number one priority. Your spouse is number two. Um, your children, number three. Your ministry, your jobs, your in entertainment, you have to set and keep those priorities in your life so that if your relationships will be everlasting, and even considering number one relationship your relationship with God as we always say whoever you spend the most time with that becomes your priority since we're going to spend our most time with God he's number one priority the next person you'll spend the most time with or should spend the most time with is your spouse your children will grow up and leave you high and dry <laughs> you put all your life in them and they say see you but the next person that you'll spend the most time with would be your spouse and then the priorities go on in that order. Amen? Amen? Number two. Well, before we get to that, let's look at Romans chapter 12. So we've been talking about this area of walking in the love of God. Just want to piggyback on that some more. The only way that we know we're truly walking in this love that God has for us and that he is number one priority is through the word of God. You examine yourself through God's word. Am I doing this? Am I walking in the, am I truly walking in the love of God? It's not that I do all these things wrong, talk to you any kind of way, treat you any kind of way, and then say, you know I love you. Because <laughs> the word of God is really the thing that will let you know that you're really walking in the love of God. Amen? So Romans chapter 12, I will read out of the Amplified Bible. Verse 9, we'll start here. It says, let your love be a sincere, a real thing. Somebody said, let your love be real. Love be real. That means you ain't faking it. You're not just acting like it, but it's coming from the heart. You can do outward things, but how many of those outward things are not lasting? You'll get tired, you'll get burned out. He says, let your love be sincere, a real thing. Hate what is evil, loathe all ungodliness, turn in horror from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. So he says, love one another with a brotherly affection as members of one family. You know how it is, the way that we love each other in our family. You know, it's all right that we can talk about each other in our family, but let somebody else outside the family talk about us, we got a problem with it. Because that's brotherly love. I mean, I could talk about my brother, but you can't. And so that's how it ought to be in the body of Christ. That we should not get in the bandwagon with everybody else and talk about all the bad things that that's happening in the body of Christ. Because, I mean, no, God's doing some awesome things in his body. Amen. And we ought to be there and stick up for one another. And so should you be in your relationships for, with your spouse and with your children, with one another, that you should be there for each other. As members love one another, as members of one family, giving precedence and showing honor to one another. And so we should love one another. We should respect one another, honor one another. That means I prefer. Somebody said prefer one, prefer one another. That means I'm not selfish. I'm not trying to get my own way. I'm not existing on my own rights. I prefer you. Hallelujah. Thank you for the amen. I appreciate it. Thank you. Verse 11, it says, never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor, be aglow and burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. And in these relationships, you know, you're showing and your servitude toward the Lord God by, um, he says, never lag in your zeal or earnest endeavor. That means don't let the fire go out in your relationship. Don't ever take each other for granted in your relationship. The same love that you had for one another when you fell in love, you should still have for one another. I always say you shouldn't fall in love, you should grow in love. 
Your love should grow and grow more and more. You should be red hot on fire for one another. It's like, oh, Pastor Cynthia. Come. It's like, we've been married 20 years. Come on, give it up. No, no you should be more in love today. Turn to your spouse and say, I love you more today than I did the day we met. And be sincere. <laughs> Listen, you ought to, it says don't lag in your zeal. You be, ought to be excited about each other, <laughs> about your children. You ought to be excited about them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, my youngest is away in college, and I, we, I was upstairs today in, in, uh, in his room, and I was like, oh, I really miss Aaron. And George says, Mom, he's right down the street. <laughs> I said, he's on campus. He doesn't come home every day. I said, I miss you when you go out. He said, Mom, I'm right here. I said, but I miss you every time you go out. I'm just so glad when you're home. And he just came and gave me that big hug. He said, that's why I love you so much, Mom. You just love. <laughs> you ought to be on fire for love for one another. And they ought to know it. Like, you know, when your spouse come home, when your children come home, they ought to see the excitement. In you. I just. <laughs> and you ought to be excited <laughs> about your spouse. Pastor Tony came home the other day and I was like, oh, here home. And all of a sudden, we have two dogs and a cat, y'all. They ran and they had all over him. I said, I'm sorry, I can't compete. <laughs> they were just like all over him. And they just, because, you know, we had been gone a while. And when we are gone a while, they, they just follow us all over the house. They just won't leave us. They want to sleep in our bed. Can you imagine two dogs and a cat trying to sleep in my bed? I was like, no, y'all, you got to go. <laughs> And they just whimper and cry. They scratch at my door all day. They like, let me in. They will not leave our sight. And they just love all over us. Well, that's if the dog can do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell your spouse, say, I'm sorry, honey, if I've not been excited for you. I am. <laughs> and from now on, I'm going to show it. Y'all ain't saying nothing to nobody. Y'all looking at me. <laughs> Tell your spouse, say, I'm still excited about you. Glory to God. Look, never lag in your zeal. It is so awesome to be in love. I can't even begin to express to you how wonderful it is to love people. <laughs> It's so much easier than being mad at them. You know, stress is a horrible thing. It's killing a lot of folk. And you just being upset, worried, and stressed out over stuff that's happening is, is, is so, loving so much easy. And you know your love has nothing to do with what the other person is doing. You can just decide to do this. So no matter what they're doing, you still love. Isn't that good? God did that for us. And he never loses his lag or his zeal for us. Do you know God loves you like that? He's excited about you. When you decide to pray, he's so excited we get to spend time with you. Glory to God. He's so in great anticipation waiting for you to come. How many ever had a sense of God waiting on you? I mean, how did that make you feel? I mean, when you took your time, it made you feel bad. But when you really got excited. When you knew he was waiting, you felt really good. Like, wow, he's waiting on me. Amen. Rejoice in verse 12. <laughs> Rejoice and exalt in hope. Be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation. Be steadfast and in patience and troubling, trouble, suffering and tribulation. It doesn't matter what trouble comes your way that you can exercise patience and suffering and still rejoice and exalt in hope. Now, I'm not saying you'll never have issues in relationship. How many have issues in relationship? You don't have to raise your hand. How many have issues a day? You don't have to raise your hand. Everybody has issues, but you rejoice in the hope, an expectation that it's not going to always be this way. Trouble's not going to always last. Hallelujah. So I can rejoice in hope. Glory to God. Be steadfast. 
Be constant and consistent in your love walk and suffering and tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And prayer would be our next step. But here you got to be constant in prayer. And if you're constantly praying for somebody, how many know you're not likely to be critical about them? You're not likely to complain about them. You're most likely not to even backbite or slander them because you're in constant prayer for them. And so if he or she or they are not doing what they're supposed to do, what are you supposed to be doing? Holly, y'all got that. Praise the Lord. Verse 13, it says, contribute to the needs of God's people, sharing in the necessity of the saints. Pursue the practice of hospitality, not just in church, but you are the church. And so in the household, contribute to the needs of God's people, not get your own water. Or you all must cook your own self. Do it yourself. It's just contributing. Y'all are real quiet in here tonight. Contributing to the needs of God's people, sharing in the necessity of the saints. How many know those people that live in your household, though they may not act like it, they are the saints of God. <laughs> I know you have told them time and time again, you ain't no saint. But God sees them as saints. And they are saints of God. And he didn't call you a saint based on your actions. He called you a saint based on his actions. And he made you the righteousness of God. And so for you to say your husband, you ain't no saint. Everybody think you some saint. You ain't no saint. He is. And you ought to treat him accordingly. And probably if you treat him like a saint, he'll act like a saint. So all, all the men said amen. And so, fellas, if you treat her like a saint, she just may act like a saint. And so if you look at her like a saint, you probably end up with a saint. <laughs> and so you, you just, ha he said, you got to contribute to the needs of God's people. And that's one of the ones we'll get to, that they're different men have different needs than women. And you have to know the different needs that each other have so that you can contribute to the needs. Sometimes you think your needs are their needs, and they're not. Things that you think about, he don't think about. But because he doesn't think about it, men, because you don't think about it, because you know it's her needs, you're going to contribute to her needs, though it may not be a need of yours. But because it's a need of hers, it now becomes a need of yours. <laughs> and because it's a need of his, it now becomes a need of yours. You need to watch the football game. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, <laughs> Pastor Tony and I did not, didn't even go to sleep Saturday. Stayed up all night just, just before the Lord preparing when we left church Sunday, we were like, we're going straight to bed. And it thing, we got Redskin season tickets. I was like, he said, I am too tired. Like, I know I can't go to the game. <laughs> and he says, well, I'm going to go because he's going to take some people. We got, you know, more than one ticket. So I'll take so-and-so and we're going to go to the game. I said, all right, bro. So he goes to the game. And I know 4.30, Pastor Tony's at the game. I can go to bed. I got up, I went downstairs, and watched the whole entire game. <laughs> and was it a great game? <laughs> There's some people in here not walking in the love of God. <laughs> watched the game. I prayed they would get interceptions, and they did. I prayed they would make a field goal, and they did. I prayed that they would catch the ball, and they did. I called Pastor Tony and said, baby, they're going to win today. I'm watching it with you. I'm right here on the couch. <laughs> He's like, really? Yes, I'm with you. He came home. He was all excited. He bought me a t-shirt. No, I'm sorry. It's not a t-shirt. He said, it's not a t-shirt, baby. It's a jersey. Okay, he brought me a jersey. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is great. A hundred and ten dollars. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> and then we went. <laughs> and so you contribute to the needs of God's people. 
sharing in the necessity of the saints, pursue the practice of hospitality, not just in church, hospitality in home, not just when you have company that comes over. You have would you like something to drink? Can I get you something? Will you want to do something? What do you want? You treat your company so great. Your husband gets home and it's like, dude, you know, hey. <laughs> do you, you know? What happened to, can I get you something to drink? Would you like something to eat? Can I get you something? <laughs> Hallelujah. You come home from work, your wife been with the kids all day, doing stuff all day. He says, honey, go lay down. I got this. I got the kids. Don't worry about it. Why don't you take a nice, long, hot bath? Hallelujah. Pursue the practice of hospitality. <laughs> I'm trying to help y'all have a lasting relationship. I'm telling you, you do this stuff, it works. Hallelujah. And it makes you feel so good about it. I mean, life is sweet. I know that he don't deserve all this stuff we're saying, but it's okay. You deserve to do it because you're just a wonderful saint of God. You're that little angel everybody's talking about. So you have to have an outlet. You have it, I mean, you just have to give. You have to meet the needs of people because that's just who you are. Hallelujah. Somebody say, help me, Jesus. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude towards you. So when they're cruel in their attitude towards you, what do you do? I'll bless them, all right. <laughs> So when they have a bad attitude towards you, what do you do? No, you go in another room, you go be by yourself, you leave the house, you go for a ride, you don't speak, you don't talk, you do the same. But what does the word say? Bless those who per persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude towards you. Have your spouse ever had an attitude towards you? Don't raise your hand especially if they're sitting next to you. <laughs> Have your kids ever had an attitude towards you? Raise your hand. <laughs> Have they ever? Yes. What do you do? I ain't giving you nothing. You don't deserve nothing. Don't you ask me for nothing. I ain't never going to get you nothing. If you ever get another pair of shoes, it'll be by your own. I ain't never. <laughs> <laughs> but what does the word say? That means that I've got to do something that will empower you to get rid of this cruel attitude that you have towards me. I've got to do something that will get rid of the attitude that you are carrying by blessing you, by empowering you, by speaking words of life over you, by giving to you, by contributing to your needs. Because there's obviously some things missing in your life for you to have this attitude when I'm such an awesome person towards you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, Pastor, I ain't getting no kids, nothing. <laughs> he says, do not bless, curse, but bless. Bless. Do not curse. Somebody said, do not curse. Do not curse. Say, bless one, another. bless one another. Stop cursing your children. Bless them. And I don't mean cursing at them, though you should not be doing that. We had one kid that says, my mom curses at us all the time. Like, no, not your mom. She's deacon. <laughs> no, Pastor, you have no idea. She curses all the time. They actually videotaped their mother cursing. <laughs> Tell us deacon so-and-so. I want to see them in my office real quick, real quick, real quick. Stop cursing your kids. Bless. And cursing is not just, I'm not talking about verbally cursing your kids, but speaking words, death words over your children's life. Speaking words that, does not, that do not empower them to prosper in areas of their lives. There is absolutely nothing your children cannot do. There is nothing that they cannot accomplish. If you empower them through the word of God, whatever God has put on their heart to do, they can accomplish it and it can be done. 
I can't even begin to tell you how many teens and children have, have committed suicide because nobody's there to affirm them. Nobody is there to bless them, to empower them. And so they have no hope. They feel like they're, they cannot accomplish anything, that they're just here. And they're young people. Life is just starting for them. How do you be 16, 17, 18 and think life is over? I mean, are you just getting a good start in life? You're getting ready to know something. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so it comes from the empowerment. It comes from you to bless and not to curse. And so it takes an effort on both. If you're, whether you're a single parent or whether you're parenting together, uh, um, you have to empower your children. This next generation will be carriers of this gospel of Jesus Christ, and they don't need no hindrance that's coming from the generation before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where God takes us in life, where he endeavor us to be in life, our ceiling becoming their floor. And so it comes from us empowering them with the word of God to bless and not to curse. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joy, and weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. And, you know, that's kind of, it's almost easy to share in someone else's joy when they're excited about something. You know, you can almost, yeah, oh, that's great, honey. It means nothing to you, but, yeah, wow, that's wonderful, you know. <laughs> and you can share in that joy. But when someone else is weeping, you may not feel, or when they're going through, or they're grieving about something, you may not feel what they feel, but you can be compassionate to what they're going through. And so here's a word of saying that you ought to rejoice when those are rejoicing. You know, you get excited when they're excited. You share in each other's joy. And I'm telling you, when you share in someone else's joy it'll rub off on you and you'll be just as excited as they are you get to share in because when you're a family together and you're in relationship together you will experience the same manifestations as they when you share in one another even in church when you hear somebody else's testimony it causes it ignites something on the inside of you that know that what God has done for somebody else he can do for you as well and what they have received, you can receive what you need from God. It may not be the same thing, but I can rejoice with you knowing that God's going to meet my need as well. And so in the family, when something good happens, you can rejoice with one another. When that child brings home a C because they got a D before, you can rejoice. They're moving forward. Like, I can't believe you just got a C. You know you could do better than that. Thank God you didn't get a D, but that you could do better than that. No, rejoice. And then bless, empower them to prosper, to get the B. And then excel in the A. How many know our children will excel above the norm? That's our resolve. Praise God. They will find their niche in life and they will excel and do exceedingly, abundantly. I finally got my middle child in school. Did y'all hear those angels? He's in school. Praise Jesus. I'm saying, but you rejoice with your children, your spouse, your husband, whatever the situation is. When they are rejoicing, you rejoice. And when they're grieving or in uh, or sorrowful or weeping about something, you can share in that. In that, you can encourage them. And through the word of God, that, yeah, understand, baby, no matter what it looks like, we're coming out, we're coming out on top. I understand how you feel, but God, we serve a big God. He's great. And what we feel today, we won't feel tomorrow. But I understand if you need to cry, come here, baby. Go ahead and cry. But I'm telling you, God, just like me, will wipe every tear from your eyes. And I'll do everything I can to make it better for you. How, are you hearing me? Now, girl, why are you crying all the time? Just stop that crying. I'm tired. I don't want them like crying around me all the time. Go somewhere. When you finish crying, then come back around me. Or vice versa. You go, man, why are you crying all the time? <laughs> I don't want no man crying all the time. Shut up. <laughs> stop that one. <laughs> anyway, so he says, rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joys. Tell your spouse, say, I'm so happy for you, honey. And you, <laughs> we weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Are y'all still saying that? Okay, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> I mean, it may something you may need to do right now. <laughs> okay, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, prideful, snobbish, high-minded, exclusive 
but readily adjust yourselves to people, things, and give yourselves to humble task. Oh, Jesus. That was a mouthful. To live in harmony with one another. Somebody say synchronize. That you come to a place in your relationships that you begin to synchronize with one another. Because of this awesome attitude of the walking and the love of God with each other, that because of this love walk, and I'm not looking at you based on circumstance, I'm looking at you through the eyes of the, of the word of God, you'll come to know each other in a different way than you have before, and you'll be able to, to easily synchronize or live in harmony with one another because now I know. There's things about you that I know you, and so I know how you are. When certain things happen, I can synchronize with you, or I can harmonize with you, be on the same page with you. I can be on the same tune with you because I know you in these circumstances, in these situations, or how you are as a person. So we get to live in harmony with one another. Are you hearing me? Elder Burns, how long have you been married? That wasn't a ch How, 40, 48 years. That is awesome. Absolutely awesome. Now, are you synchronized? <laughs> are you synchronized, Elder Robert? <laughs> he said, what? He said, beyond synchronized. <laughs> the two have become one. <laughs> And, and so that's what we endeavor to do. I'm not going to ask how long it will take you to get that because, you know, everybody's different. So. But you can imagine being in a family together that you begin to harmonize and you begin to synchronize with one another. You get to know each other in relationships. And that's what God desires, that you would live in harmony with one another, not being haughty or prideful, snobbish or high-minded or be exclusive. Ain't nobody like you. You're the greatest thing that ever happened to the family. Everybody is catered to wait on you. You know, the whole atmosphere in a negative way. When you walk in the door, everybody say, here comes dad. Let's run out of here. Let's go. You know, oh, dad's in a bad mood today. Everybody, let's get out the house. Your wife, pack up all the kids. Let's go to the mall somewhere. Let's go do something. Let's get away from, let's get away from mom she's screaming again dad is like you know protecting the kids because you crazy I mean he says don't be these things don't be exclusive but readily adjust yourself somebody said adjust yourself stop waiting for everybody to adjust to you adjust yourself adjust yourself to people things and give yourself to humble task. And so there are some things that you're going to be asked to do that may humble you. Picking up his, you know what, and they dirty. Giving yourselves, <laughs> how many don't know what I just meant? Okay. Giving yourselves to humble task. I had to do that tonight. <laughs> I mean, the sink is here, the hamper is here. Why is that on the sink? <laughs> Giving yourselves to humble, to, how many know that has to humble yourself to pick up somebody's dirty? You have to come low. <laughs> And here's the real humility, you don't complain. Here's the real humility, you don't even mention it. Somebody say, help me, Jesus. You don't mention it a week later. You don't mention it in that heated conversation. When he said you didn't do something, you don't go, well, I pick up your... Every time you leave them, who has to pick it up? You don't even mention it. <laughs> you give yourself to humble task. When she asks you to go to the grocery store or the drugstore to get you know what? 
It's like, I'm not going in the store and getting that. That's a lady's stuff. You go get your own stuff. I ain't going to be seeing nobody seeing me get that. <laughs> well, honey, I need you to go. Go now. What's it called again? What color is the box? <laughs> what size? Long, short, or medium? I don't know. <laughs> You, you give yourselves <laughs> to humble task. How many men know what I'm talking about? I ain't going to ask you how many you didn't do it. But you have humble task. You're in the mall. She's on a roll. She's shopping real good. But that purse is getting heavy. Honey. Carry my purse. You give yourselves to humble task. No problem, baby. <laughs> it's not destroying your manhood. The other women are looking at you like, look at that, that man. <laughs> you worried about the other men looking at you like that. But they're not looking at you like that. They said, there's a real man. He's carrying his wife's purse. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, for all of you that have not done that, and she's asked you repeatedly, apologize right now. he says listen we're still in verse 16 here and so adjust yourself to people and things and give yourselves to humble task you know you're both thirsty in the middle of the night honey can you give me some water baby I'm thirsty too you could either make a game out of it <laughs> or lay there and fuss about it or say hey why don't we go downstairs together and I'll fry you some eggs while we're down there <laughs> Somebody's getting this back there. I thank you. I appreciate this. Somebody said steps to a lasting relationships. Hallelujah. And so even where your children are concerned, giving yourselves to humble task, and you know, we might not think they're humble, but you know. When you have children who don't have their license yet, how many know you become cab driver? And they have to go here, they have to go there, they got to go everywhere. And what's important to them certainly may not be nowhere near important to you. But going to that football game is important to them. I need a ride to the game. I need a ride to practice. I need a ride to study hall. I need a ride to so-and-so house. I need a ride to church. I need a ride to practice. I need a ride. Give yourselves to humble task. And don't complain. You defeat the purpose if you do something for somebody and you complain the whole time you're doing it. You get no brownie points with them and you certainly get none with God and you don't have nothing to show for it. You're not filling anybody's tank. What I mean by that, there's no love being displayed when you do something for somebody and you complain about it. Because if you would bring it up later, well, remember I did all these things for you? What? Because you complain the whole time that nobody feels like you did anything for them. I mean, they may have gotten what they wanted because they needed it, but they don't feel good about it. And it makes them very hesitant to even ask you to do anything else again because of the attitude that you have. And so it's good that, you know, you don't have an attitude. If you decide that this is what I'm going to do for you, then don't have an attitude about it. And don't act like the world owes you because of what you decide to do in love. And so when love, in order for you to benefit from walking in the love of God, that you give it away with nothing, with no expectation of something in return. Because if you have an expectation of something in return, that is your reward. But there's a greater reward in heaven. There's a greater reward from the kingdom that you receive when you walk in the love of God and you have a good attitude about it. Hallelujah. 
I'll drop you off at your game. Is so-and-so mama bringing all y'all back, or do you need me to come back and get you? <laughs> I'll call so-and-so mama, see if she can get you, okay? <laughs> I'll take you, she bring you, okay? <laughs> if not, baby, I'll, I'm not going to have my baby stranded. You can always count on daddy. You can always count on mama. Are you hearing me? Mom, dad, sister, brother, whoever you send. <laughs> Somebody from the elite team will be there to get you, honey. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you know, and then there are sometimes my kids will say, Mom, can you not send somebody to pick me up? Can you come get me yourself? <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> sure. What time? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to call you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll be waiting. <laughs> With a smile. Hallelujah. They're like, Mom, you're so great. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful to hear? Dad, you're so awesome. Praise God. It's so great to, to see Instagram and tweets when my kids say, hey, I have the greatest parents in the world. And I didn't do anything for them to say that, but I'm, I'm, I'm seeing and reading it in a tweet or a Facebook or Instagram. I don't like those Instagram pictures, but it's okay. But <laughs> they post a picture of me and say, this is the greatest mom in the world. Like, wow, isn't that awesome? And I didn't even do anything today. Praise God. But they remember those humble tasks. It says, never ever estimate yourself. Or be wise in your own conceit. Don't ever overestimate yourself. I mean, do you know who I am? Do you know who you have? Do you know who you're living with? (laughs) But none of y'all have ever heard anything like that in your house. So we don't have to worry about it. But you yourself, don't ever overestimate yourself. Everybody else can think you're great, but you stay humbled in your own side. 17, repay no evil for evil, but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble, aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. This is your aim, to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. So I'm not paying evil for evil, but I am taking thought to do what is honest and what is proper and what is noble. And so I'm not, you did that to me, I'm going to do that back to you. You were evil to me, I'm going to be evil to you. You yell at me, I'm going to yell at you. You shout at me, I'm going to shout at you. You do that to me, you're going to regret you ever did that to me. You're going to regret the day you ever said that to me. You're going to be miserable for the rest of your life for what you've done to me. You understand? And then you got people paying for other people. Well, he did that to me, the next person's going to pay for it. And so don't get quiet now because, you know, when you get quiet, we have to stay here and we got to linger long and we got to talk to you about your issues and then, <laughs> and then you're mad at me and then <laughs> just say, yes, amen. amen. That was fake. That was fake. <laughs> that was fake. So fake. You do not render, do not repay no one evil for evil. When someone is negative and you are negative in return, two negative things is not going to produce anything positive. And so to you to be evil because somebody else is evil, no good is going to come out of that. You can't say, well, he did that to me. I'm going to do this and make sure he never do this again because I'm going to be so mean that he'll never want me to be mean again. And it, um, he ends up being meaner. He ends up being mad at you now. You end up, you were mad at him first for what he did wrong, and now you're so evil. Now he's mad at you, forgot about what he did wrong, and now you're on a short end of the stick getting the brunt of him being angry at you because you've been evil about something he did that wasn't even all that because you're trying to treat him a lesson. And so it's not worth it, and that goes vice versa in your relationship and so you don't repay evil for evil you have to overcome and we're going to get to that overcome evil with good when someone does have a bad attitude towards you we do what we have to go back up (laughs) when someone has an evil or wicked attitude or cruel attitude towards you what we do if somebody's evil towards you you don't repay evil for evil 
your aim to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. If possible, verse 18, as, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Somebody say, it depends on me, depends on me. for there to be peace in my house. Now, I, we understand that this peace comes from God. We not, obviously, but you've got to allow God to channel his peace through your life. And so he said, as far as it is possible, it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So it's up to you to live at peace and have peace in the home. And so you're the one that, that will create that atmosphere. Hopefully it will be everybody in the home that be the one that would create the atmosphere of peace in your home. There are times when children have to be the one that create the peace of God in their homes. Parents are going at it, and the kids got to say, Mom, Dad, can y'all stop? Why can't you just get along? I'm not going to ask you how many kids have had said that to you as parents. Don't raise your hand. There are parents that go at it, and their kids like, we can't take it. They turn their music up loud, or they come in, Mom, why are you always fussing? Why can't you just be quiet? Dad, why are you just leave Mom alone? You know how she is. Why are you always doing this? Be quiet. And then you go, shut up, get in your room. Leave us alone. You don't know what you're talking about. You're just a kid. You have no idea. Just get away from us. And everybody's screaming in the house. Nobody's getting along, and all the devil is going crazy. But you realize that it's you. I'm glad I'm entertaining you, Terrence. <laughs> but it's you are the one that has to keep the peace in the house. Some of y'all are like, dang, was she there yesterday? <laughs> and so your kids that grow up screaming at everybody, their friends and stuff, and they don't think anything of it because my parents say they love each other, but they, you know, they always yelling and screaming at each other. And I like you, so if I like you, I'm gonna scream at you too. And, and you don't, they don't want. Why am I repelling all my friends? Why nobody want to be around me? Because you're screaming. Well, that's what my parents do. And then when they tr trying to hear from God, they waiting for God to yell at them, not realizing it's in the still small voice that God would speak to them. And they grow up, Mom, I can't hear the voice of God. God's talking to you all the time. No, I can't hear him. God's talking to you all the time. He's not yelling. <laughs> and so, because we realize that the things that we're, we're not walking in love of God and we think it's okay, but God's not pleased with that. And so, as much as it lies within you, with all possibility, that it depends on you, that you'll be the one that will create peace. It takes two people to argue. And if you're not saying anything, guess what? Eventually, they'll be quiet. And there is a, there's a time and there are ways of communicating with one another, and we will get to the part of communicating in this lesson as well. Verse 18, again, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. Verse 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but live the way open for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, requite, saith the Lord. And so I'm not going out to avenge myself, I just give it over to God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Jesus said when they reviled him, he didn't revile back. When they talked about him, he didn't talk about them back. When they did things, that they didn't, he didn't do it back. He gave himself to, he had a consciousness toward God. And so he gave it over to God and allowed God to deal with that situation. And so I'm not out to get revenge. Okay, yeah, all right, you did that. i I sleep with one eye open if I was you, bro. <laughs> You understand. And so you got this attitude that you want to pay back, you want to give back. And even when, you know, there are parents that want to give back at their children, waiting for them to fail, hoping that they will fail, jealous of their kids, ready to pay back for whatever, I don't know. You, I was in 19, 19 hours of late with you, you're going you gonna to get it too. And then you have parents that say things to their kids like, you caused me all this trouble when you was a kid. The same thing going to happen to you when you have your kids. And they having, they having issues with their, your grandkids. And you're going to say, well, that's what you get. That's what you did to me. They're your grandkids. These are your children. Bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. 
just like you desired it for your children, you ought to more, that much more desire it of your grandchildren. And if it is something that you see in them, remember the Proverbs said that your children are a reflection of who you are. And so the reason why they act the way they do, maybe because it's you. And if that's you, break the generational curse. Don't allow the enemy to destroy your family and you watch it happen and say, well, that's what you get. Because that's what your mama told you. And so you've got to be, you have to be wise. Don't allow the enemy to take things that are happening in your family and use those things against you. And you seek revenge or avenge, you're trying to avenge yourself of things, the wrong things that have been done to you by family members or um, things that other people have done to you that you are taking out on your family. And they're not the same person. Well, that person did that to me before. I said I would never let nobody do that to me again. This is what I'm going to do the next time that happened. And they were, had no party of what happened to you before. So he said, don't avenge yourself. God said, vengeance is mine. I will requite, saith the Lord. And so you give it and put it like Jesus. We, we have a consciousness toward God, and we give it over to God. Hallelujah. Somebody said, I give it over to God. I will not avenge myself. I will walk in the love of God. Hallelujah. God heard you. Verse 20, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If an enemy is hungry, you're going to feed him. So if your spouse is hungry, guess what? <laughs> they're not your enemy. If they're hungry, you ought to feed them. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome, master evil with good. How do I master the evil that's coming against me? Somebody said do good. Isn't that powerful? That you can master evil? That it doesn't have, have to have an effect on your life? That you don't have to be succumb to the evil that is done to you or that an evil that is in the world? You can master it by just simply doing good. And have a consciousness of doing good all the time. Tell your spouse that I want to do you good all the time. Hallelujah. Somebody said, I receive it. <laughs> Glory to God. And so God gives you an, uh, the ability to master evil by doing good and being good, being kind. Remember, love is kind. Love is patient. Being kind to one another overcoming the evil that is being done to you. And how I many know everybody, no matter who you are, may have one day or another a bad day, a bad time. Whether it's by something that somebody else has done to you on your job, on the highway, in the grocery store, somebody have, may have some, hit some nerve on the inside of you that will cause you to be in a disposition unlike God. And whenever people come in contact with you, they will know it. <laughs> But your position is not to let that overcome you. You've got to overcome it. You've got to master it. Not by harnessing it, not by harnessing the evil, not by meditating on the evil, not by holding it in. You've got to release it in good. Hallelujah. And so you, what, that person that have said something wrong to you, have done something wrong to you, then don't retaliate with evil. Don't retaliate with negative words. Say something good. I don't know, you know, maybe you're having a bad day or something's going wrong. Is there anything I can do to help you? And they may even get meaner. And that is one of, you know what, I'm just going to pray for you. I just believe, God, that whatever you're going through, that God is able to bring you out of that. Because God didn't make us that way. And then you just continue to have the attitude of being a good person. And you'll see, the Bible says you reap coals You'll heap coal, burning coals upon their head. It's going to come to a place where you know burning coals upon your head, you can't take it. You, you be so good to somebody, they can't take it. They're going to have the good going to come out of that. You hear me? You ever had somebody be so good to you, you were trying to be mean to them, and you decided, I'm going to be good. You just give in. You're just going to be good. Anybody ever had that happen to you? Amen. Two of y'all. Well, yeah, you ain't lived long enough. <laughs> you, you, you have somebody d d to, to do something. Um, you are in a position where you might not have been the one that's doing good, but somebody's been good to you. Maybe y'all haven't had enough people doing good to you. Husbands, be good to your wife. Wife, be good to your husband. Parents, be good to your children. 
Church, be good to one another. Amen. Hallelujah. I remember when I was a kid, my mom um, remarried, and I didn't know how I felt about that. Um, I was a kid, so I didn't know how I felt about it. And so her husband, my stepfather, he was extremely nice to me, like over the top nice to me, like give me the world nice to me. And I was mean. <laughs> I was mean in a quiet way. <laughs> I was just, hmm. You give me something I didn't want it, didn't pay attention to it, didn't look at it. No matter how nice he was to me, I was just not going for it. And I had no reason for it, none at all. And he wasn't faking it, trying to make, win me over or anything like that. I mean, just if I wanted to do something and my mom said, no, you can't do that. He says, oh, let her do that. I'm like, I don't care if you said that. And, you know, I was just like, he's just over the top, so nice to me. And he finally broke me down. <laughs> He finally broke me down, and I'm telling you, we were the best of friends. I mean, the best of best. He's more of a father to me than my natural father. And don't tell my natural father that if you ever meet him. And so <laughs> I'm believing God for him to come visit us here in church. So if you ever meet him, say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> and so he was just so over the top. Not, it just keep coals of fire upon my head. And I couldn't help but retaliate in love. And love him. And we had the awesome relationship. He's home, be with the Lord. He's watching me now preach because he always comes to every service I preach. And so he's watching me as I minister. But I'm telling you, that love of God, when, you're, when somebody does evil and you're evil, nothing comes of it. Try being good and see what happens. You overcome, master evil simply by being good. Amen? Amen. Did I help anybody tonight? Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, come on, stand to your feet. Our time is up. We'll pick up this again. Hallelujah. Somebody said, I'm going to go home. Well, before I leave church, <laughs> I will practice the word of God I've heard. I will, I desire to walk in the love of God. Praise God. So everybody who's married ought to be excited right now because your spouse is going to walk in the love of God. Hallelujah. Those of you that are in relationships in your home, whether you're parents or um, you're living with parents, whatever, case, your home will be full of peace because of your decision. There will be nothing lacking, nothing missing, nothing broken. Ultimately, where we're going with all of these lessons on Sundays and Tuesdays is that we were creating a house of worship. Amen. That there will be no hindrances to our homes being a house, a place of worship. And you can't be a place of worship fussing, arguing, complaining, backbiting, not supporting and being there for one another. But when you are there, your home becomes a place of worship where God dwells. And then you'll see awesome manifestations, not only in the house of God, but in your home as well. And that's where we're after, that people will know that God is a real God, wants to do some great things in their lives, and that they'll run to your house, your place of worship, your home, because of the peace of God. Your neighbors will, will flock at your doorstep because there's something about your house that's different from every house in the neighborhood, unless you live next door to me. <laughs> then they'll be coming to both our houses. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Come on, lift your hands high to heaven. Let me pray over your life. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the word of God that we've heard here tonight. We thank you, Lord God, and we ask that you would hide the word in our hearts that we will not sin against you, Lord Jesus. We desire more than anything, Lord God, to be an example of who you are in our lives, to be an example of the love of God that you've shed abroad in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we give you free access to move in and through our lives. Bring us and take us to that place where we'll be doing things that are pleasing in your sight. It is our heart's desire to, not to owe any man anything but to love him. And so we thank you, Lord God. None of us are indebted to anyone because we have the love of God. We thank you, Lord God, that you said if all possible, if it, if it depends on us, 
that peace will come from us and be in our homes. God, it does depend on us. And we thank you for the peace of God that you've given us, your peace that passes all men's understanding, your peace that keeps our heart and mind in perfect peace, your peace that acts like an umpire in our hearts, Lord God. We thank you for the peace of God that passes even our understanding. Even when hell is breaking loose, we have the peace of God. God, we desire to display that peace in our homes, that there will be nothing lacking, nothing missing, nothing broken, and out of fellowship in our home. We have fellowship with one another because of our fellowship and our love that we have for you, Lord God. Father, I speak the peace of God over every home that is represented here tonight, Lord God. I evict the devil in the name of Jesus. You will not run havoc in our lives any longer. You have no part, no lot in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, that the love that you have in our hearts will be on display between a husband and his wife, a wife and her husband and our children, our other relatives, our family members, and in our household, Lord God. Father, bring the word of God to our remembrance so we will not be just hearers of the words, but we'll be doers of the word of God. We thank you as we continue to look in the mirror of your word, we are changed from one image to another image of your glory, your manifested presence, Lord God, that when other comes around us, what is overshadowing us will overshadow them, Lord God, and that is your love. They'll be blinded by your love, Lord God, and any evil or wicked person that will come in our path, we thank you, Lord God, that our goodness, our kindness toward them will heap coals of fire upon their heads, Lord God, and they will see and know us by our love that we have for you and we have for humanity. God, help us, Lord God. And those of us that have issues tonight, Lord God, we've been upset or stressed about something that have taken place in our lives. And we've heard this message. We have a decision to make. And God, I'm praying that they will decide for you. They will decide to walk in the love of God. They will decide to forget those things that are behind and press toward things that are before them. That they will take you at their word, Lord God. And they will see your word manifest in and through their lives, Lord. And they will experience your love, Lord God. Your love that never fails. Your love that washes away sin. Your love that's never obsolete, never comes to an end, never fades away. God, they will experience your love that will flood them like a river, Lord God. They will know and experience your love, Lord Jesus, that you have toward them and that they're able to give toward someone else. So, Father, we dispel every issue, every circumstance, every spirit of worry and stress in the name of Jesus. And, God, we thank you that your peace covers a multitude of sin, Lord God. Your love. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you're so long-suffering toward us, willing that none of us would perish, but all of us will come to a place of change or repentance. And so, God, we thank you that that same love you have for us, we can display that love for someone else. We thank you that we're long-suffering, full of patience and kindness toward one another, not rendering evil for evil, Lord God, nor railing for railing. We thank you, Lord God, that we're coming together as one, spirit soul and body so we thank you lord jesus there is no more separation we come against the spirit of separation and divorce of any kind the very thought of it we cast down every wicked and evil imagination in the name of jesus and we bring it to nothing it won't come it won't produce anything father you said in your word you hate divorce you hate marital separation you were the actual witness at the vows that we taken before you lord god and we thank you lord god that you are a covenant keeping god we are covenant keeping people and we don't break the vows that you have given us lord god but by your love we will love one another and we thank you father and we give you praise for it Father, help us to be the parents that you've called us to be, Lord God. Father, we curse every seed that has been spoken that is against your will over our children. We pray for a crop failure. It will not produce anything. But God, your perfect and divine will will be accomplished in their lives. Teach us. Give us the wisdom to be the parents that you have called us to be. Give us revelation, Lord God, concerning the word of God, concerning parenting, Lord. Help us to reach that child, Lord Jesus, for the kingdom of heaven. We declare and decree household salvation in the name of Jesus. 
that everyone is healthy, everyone is whole, everyone is prosperous, everyone's name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, everyone is full of the power and the presence of your Spirit, Lord God. We thank you for the glory of God that will be seen in every one of our homes. Your manifested presence, Lord God. We give you praise for it. We believe we receive it in the matchless name of Jesus. Come on and say, I believe I receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, if you just lift your hands up high, I believe God's pouring in some wisdom, pouring in some comfort, pouring in some peace over your life and into your family. Just lift your hands and just be in a posture of receiving. I just sense that God is just pouring some things in your life. He's putting some things up on you. He's causing you to have breakthrough in areas where you've never had the breakthrough. Breakthrough is coming to your home. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus. We believe for the breakthrough, Lord God. For our spouses, for our children, for our family members, we receive breakthrough. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you that you're preparing your single people that are to be married, God. We thank you that you're giving them full of the wisdom of God, the revelation that comes from God to be successful in the endeavor they are about to embark upon. We thank you, Lord God. You said a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. God, help him to find the wife. Help her to see and to know the man of her dreams, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God. Move upon your people, Lord Jesus. We're open to receive from you your perfect and divine will for our lives. We thank you, Lord God. We desire to be happy, Lord God. And happy is the man that keeps your word. We thank you, Lord God, for giving us your word, manifesting and confirming your word with signs following. Help us to be doers of that word, Lord God, to receive from your hand all that you have for us. We thank you for pouring fresh oil upon every household now in the name of Jesus. Fresh oil, fresh oil poured upon your people, Lord God. We thank you for the fire of the Holy Ghost that is burning out anything that's not like you, God. Burn out anything that's not like you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We receive from you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Somebody said, I receive the fresh oil in my home. Everything's new. Father, I thank you for the fire of the Holy Ghost that will burn out and burn up anything that's not like you. I receive it. We walk in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise you, Jesus. Glory. Well, let's receive tonight's tithe and offering. Praise.